Welcome, everyone, to this podcast introduction to Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. What a wonderful summer I'm already having. Uh, it's a beautiful June here in North Dakota. I'm heading out next week to go to Sioux Falls and then Wall, South Dakota. You know, Wall Drug, the famous Wall Drug. I'm going to be touring an ICBM missile site uh, that is uh, operated um, by the national government of the United States near Phillip, South Dakota. And then on to the Sand Creek Massacre near Pueblo, Colorado. I've got some work to do in Vail uh, in mid-June, but this is a journey along the way to all of that, and I couldn't be more excited. Almost everything I do now winds up being good fruit for listening to America. Go to our website, ltamerica.org, and sign up for our newsletter. It comes out every week, or at most every second week. We are up and running. Still need the Airstream. Still need your contributions to our to our themes. We did water in the West. We'll continue to look at that subject. You know, uh, Lake Powell is now up 40 feet, maybe going up to 70 or more. Lake uh, Mead, uh, behind Hoover Dam, is just up 10 feet, and who knows what will happen with that. It's all about how they push water downstream. Of course, their main recipient of that water is California, uh, and in spite of the attempts by the national government to sort all this out, so far, California gets its share. It's an amazing time in my life. I want to thank you for being part of it. You know, we were a little bit reluctant to shift from the Jefferson Hour to listening to America, but I think it's going to pay off in the quality of the program in some important ways. I'm very excited about it. And Lindsay Trevinsky has agreed to continue to be one of our most frequent guests. Joe Ellis will be here. And when he is, David Swenson uh, will come out of retirement uh, to host those programs. David DeCandry will continue to be our West Coast uh, correspondent for questions of the Enlightenment. And I'll be doing a whole series of programs from the road. I'm going in uh, just a few days to South Dakota, heading to the Pine Ridge uh, and to uh, what once was known as Harney Peak in the Black Hills, now Black Elk Peak. It's a good and very important name change. The beginning, I hope, of a, a whole range of name changes in the American West. I'm writing a book, two of them, actually three of them, but the book I'm working on at the moment is a history of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. The Great Steinbeck Trip will be occurring in the spring of 2024. I'll do it in five segments, but I will do all of Steinbeck within a calendar year or just a little bit above that. This is going to be one of the most extraordinary adventures of my life, and we need you to be part of it. Uh, we want you to make suggestions, follow along in the reading. I'm going to read all of Steinbeck from start to finish during that journey. Uh, we want you to suggest places that I visit, uh, people that I meet. If you can contribute to the success of this project, uh, so much the better. I'm also continuing to work on the Edward S. Curtis project. Curtis was a photographer between 1905 and 1935. He took 40,000 images, dry glass plate images, of Native Americans and landscapes of the American West. And they're widely regarded as the greatest photographs ever taken. So I'm working with elders. I've already had six or so interviews with uh, Ab Siroka, the Crow, and the Pigon, the Blackfeet, and the Hopi about Curtis's work. Uh, in some quarters, um, he's criticized for romanticizing natives and, to a certain degree, for cultural appropriation. But most Native people have deep appreciation for what he did and, in fact, recognize their own ancestors and some of their own life ways in his gorgeous photographs. Starting to read books to get ready for the 250th anniversary of the United States. That's coming in 2026. I have great misgivings about this. It's going to be the culture wars on double steroids. Uh, so I want to read about 30 books that will sort of help me think about America at 250. So beginning with Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which was published between 1835 and 40, maybe the greatest book ever written about America by a non-American. But I want to read a history of the women's movement in America, history of the civil rights movement in America, history of white Indian relations in America. I'll read Bowling Alone, Putnam's book about the sort of increasing isolation of the American people. That was before the coming of smartphones and social media. But if you have thoughts about books that persons should read to make sense of this extraordinary nation, on the eve of our 250th birthday, send me a note. You'll see at ltamerica.org that there are ways to reach me. And we're going to try to create a kind of a book club where you can follow along in all of this. And today, on today's program, I will talk about it here. 
Lindsay Chervinsky and I talk 10 things about John Quincy Adams. I have a great interest in John Adams. He's in some ways my favorite of the Founding Fathers because he's so gritty, so earthy, so vain, so irascible, so self-divided envious of everybody else, including, of course, Jefferson, but such a great, important contributor to our national independence, uh, the author of the Constitution of Massachusetts, uh, upon which many other state constitutions were based, one of our supreme diplomats, not a great president, but a president who preferred peace to war, and I think that's always worth celebrating, and the father of a very great son, John Quincy Adams. Lindsay's working on the Adams family now, writing about them, and I've been thinking about John Quincy Adams. You know, he has a relationship to North Dakota because he squared off the northern border of the country at the 49th parallel. Had he not stepped in to do that, much of North Dakota, about two-fifths, maybe two-and-a-half-fifths, uh, would be Canada, would be part of British North America because that's the drainage of the Red River Hudson Bay system. But it was John Quincy Adams who stubbornly insisted that we protect the northern border and brought that about in 1818. So let's go to the program. Thank you so much. We're so pleased that you're enjoying this. We've gotten tremendous feedback. Keep us posted. Let us know what you like and don't like, what you want more of or less of, themes that we should pursue. This is a, a time of extraordinary growth at Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. So let's go to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. Today, my guest, Dr. Lindsay Trevinsky, and I discuss 10 things about John Quincy Adams. His dates are 1767 to 1848. He's the sixth president of the United States and the son of the second president of the United States, the famous John Adams. Lindsay, welcome. Thank you so much for having me back, and I'm delighted we are talking about this subject. And you were saying this may take more than one program because he's so fascinating. He is, and he's not only so fascinating as a person, but his life encompassed so much of American history and so many big, pivotal moments that we're going to have to touch on a lot of them. You know, if you asked 100 people to name some presidents, they would name Lincoln and Washington and Theodore Roosevelt and FDR and John Kennedy. Almost nobody in the first round would mention John Quincy Adams, and yet he's a very consequential president of the United States. He is. And I do think his presidency gets a little bit of a bad rap because he left the nation, at least on much better terms diplomatically than when he came in. But I also think it's fair to say that one of the reasons his presidency and is overlooked and therefore he's maybe not remembered as well is some of his greatest moments came not when he was president, came either before or after, which we will of course discuss. So let me get right to the heart of the issue. You know, he stood for the presidency in 1824 at the end of the Monroe administration. There were several others running. It wasn't a really settled two-party system yet. He does not win the popular popular vote. He does not win the electoral vote. It goes to the House of Representatives. Thereafter, almost everybody believed that there had been a corrupt bargain, that he had had some sort of backroom understanding with Henry Clay of Kentucky, and that Henry Clay then delivered the votes in the House of Representatives that would be needed to get John Quincy Adams over the top. Is it fair to say that this was a corrupt bargain? I don't think so. I mean, we all know that people often will support those various candidates in return for the expectation of some position. So for example, during the 2000 election, Pete Buttigieg was one of the primary candidates. He dropped out, he endorsed Biden, then became a cabinet secretary. It's not a corrupt bargain, it's how politics work. But what I think people forget is that Henry Clay despised Andrew Jackson. He loathed Andrew Jackson. He was not going to swing his delegates or use any of his influence to help Andrew Jackson under any circumstances. And he knew that the other options were not going to get close enough to have a majority. So there was really only one option for him. Mm, okay, I hear you. But Jackson won a plurality of the votes in the popular election. He was clearly the people's favorite. He was unhappy in the extreme and came back like a locomotive four years later to become the seventh president of the United States and served for two terms. There was a sense then that an injustice had been done to him because he was the people's candidate. That's fair, although I would say that we've had a lot of elections where the people's choice has not won. So maybe the injustice is the Electoral College as opposed to the outcome in 1824. Yeah, structural problem. Let's go to your list. So number one, 
Bunker Hill. What's the story? Well, one of the amazing things about John Quincy Adams' life is it spans from the Battle of Bunker Hill to almost the Civil War. He served in Congress with Abraham Lincoln, which is just mind-blowing. He really comes on to the scene when the Battle of Bunker Hill breaks out in 1775. His father, John Adams, is at the Continental Congress serving as one of the Massachusetts delegates. His mother, Abigail, he was their oldest son, took him to a nearby hill and they looked out to see what the sound was and they watched the Battle of Bunker Hill happening. Those are the stakes which he understands and is beginning to think about history, is this battle of trying to define the independence of the nation. So Lexington and Concord were in a sense skirmishes. Bunker Hill is the first real battle. I love this story because Abigail Adams is, is an amazing human being no matter how you measure it. And she takes her young son by the hand and they stand there and they watch this thing happening across a space and she wants him to know what's at stake. I mean, her commitment to her husband, to liberty, to the idea of the United States is so huge. And you just already get the sense that they're fashioning him for a great destiny. They are, and they are instilling in him a sense that whatever he was witnessing and whatever he was doing was history. You know, she was keenly aware that what her husband was doing was historic, and she wanted John Quincy to appreciate why he was gone and what was happening, but she wanted him to also understand the historic moment that they were living in. And so we think of the Kennedys as a dynasty and maybe the Bushes. This is a real dynasty. John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Charles Francis Adams, his son, and Charles Francis Adams' son, Henry Adams, who wrote the great book, The Education of Henry Adams, maybe the most extraordinary book of the 19th century about America by an American. This is a family that had a very strong place in the destiny of the United States. And in a certain sense, you feel a little bit sorry for some of them. And, and I do feel a little sorry for John Quincy Adams. I grew up in the 1960s, Dr. Benjamin Spock. Parents had a kind of laissez-faire, do your own thing, we won't interfere, find your happiness sort of attitude. Nothing like that in John and Abigail. No, and we, we see that, I think, over the generations because most of the Adamses can't take that pressure. In every generation, it's as though all of the genius and all of the ability to withstand the pressure goes to one person. Then the others, and it's really actually quite tragic, the brothers end up, there's a lot of suicide, there's a lot of alcoholism, there's a lot of real sorrow, and that Adam's legacy weighs heavily on the people that have to inherit it. Charles, the other son, and Thomas, another son, both wound up dying young, deeply in debt, severe alcoholics, lives in disarray. And John and Abigail try to step in from time to time to make things right. It just can't happen. The pressure was such an amazing fact of life there that most of John Q's siblings miscarried. His sister, Nabby, had breast cancer and, and died from that at a time when we had no real response to such things. But the, the sense of, not entitlement, but but responsibility of all of the sons is such that you can't help but feel two things. One is that it must have been difficult to be in that family. And secondly, it edges up on abuse, right? To put that much pressure on any child. I want to read to you this letter Abigail wrote to him when he first went over to Europe with his father, and here's what she said to poor young J.Q. For dear as you are to me, I had much rather you should have found your grave in the ocean, or any untimely death crop you in your infant years, rather than see you an immoral profligate or a graceless child. That's going to take some therapy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, I have a couple of responses to that. One, what's interesting is there always seems to be one son that gets extra pressure. And John Quincy Adams is the son that gets extra pressure. And partly that's because it's very clear from the very beginning that he's brilliant. And he's, he's the first son. He's a genius. There's a lot writing there. And yet, I think what some of the other brothers struggled with, by all accounts, they were delightful people. These were not mean men. They were not bad men. They were good humans, but they didn't have his genius and they knew it. That great first story about Bunker Hill. Then your second on your list is that young JQ really is a, not even yet a teenager, crosses the ocean when that was a very dangerous thing to do with his father to serve as his father's diplomatic secretary. Yeah, it's absolutely nuts. He's barely a teenager. I mean, he already speaks multiple languages. So this this 
child is a prodigy. As someone who struggles with, you know, I can't really get past one language. I just, it blows my mind. His father brings him in and feels it would be good for him to see the world, that he would be educated at all these different places. He'd see different cultures. He would have a firsthand training in diplomacy. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, that really worked. JQA was a man of the world. He had an understanding of different cultures, which sometimes put him at odds with his fellow Americans because he was so much more worldly and so much more cultured. He loved to continue to try and master languages. So when he was in Berlin, he was determined that he would be able to to speak and to read German. And later on in his life, he makes himself translate things in German. I mean, it's just relentless. But It was also not comfortable. They often ended up landing in places they didn't intend. They had to go on, I think it was on the back of a donkey over some of the hills in Spain to get to where they were going. So this was a childhood kind of unlike any other. You know, I can only think of John Adams as a kind of a comic figure, even though he was a very serious man. But he's portly. He's irascible. He had a great sense of humor, though. So I think he would have actually appreciated that. So they're they're rolling like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza over the low mountains of Spain to these diplomatic posts. I want to throw in one of my own here, and that's John Quincy Adams' relationship with Thomas Jefferson. Later in life, when JQ becomes president, John Adams writes a letter to Jefferson, a very gracious letter, and says, you know, thanks for congratulating me. In some sense, he was almost as much your son as mine, because we were all there in Paris, and you took him under your wing and you treated him with respect and, you know, that he's never gotten over that. And so this is a bit of nostalgia because it didn't take J.Q. long to decide that Jefferson was an unreliable human being and particularly unreliable with respect to his father, John Adams. In the craziness of the 1790s and the election of 1800, that Jefferson had a series of journalistic attacks not only on Adams, the policymaker, but on Adams, the human being. Nobody really got over this. John Adams was the most forgiving. Abigail, a little less, and J.Q., not. And he just he just couldn't stand Jefferson. And he said that, at one time, Jefferson said that when he was in Paris, the Seine had frozen over, and John Quincy in his diary says, no, that never happened. And then Jefferson told him that, that he had learned Spanish. And so John Q. Adams knows what it takes to learn a language. Jefferson said that he had learned Spanish while crossing the Atlantic over 19 days with a copy of Don Quixote in Spanish and a dictionary. And John Quincy Adams says... Jefferson tells tall stories like, no, this is, this did not happen. I love this. And then when Jefferson's letters were published after Jefferson's death, three volumes of them, J.Q. read these and kept a kind of an active journal as he was reading it. He got madder and madder and madder and madder. He just he just loathed what Jefferson represented your view of the of that relationship people often say like you know you could i can criticize my mother but you can't criticize my mother nowhere was that more true with john quincy adams and john adams he was extremely protective of his father and never forgave jefferson and i think that that really colored everything that came after as senator from massachusetts he sided with the jefferson administration on many occasions to the point that his own federalists were appalled by this and really turned on JQ for siding on the Louisiana Purchase Treaty, partly on the Embargo Acts and so on. That's why he became the sixth president, is that he, in a certain sense, got on board with the Virginia dynasty. That's one of our subjects, so let's pick up there. We need to take a break. We're talking with the great Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, the author of The Cabinet. You're listening to Listening to America. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Listening to America. I'm talking with Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, 10 Things About J.Q. Adams, the sixth president of the United States. So when we went to break, you said we should talk about his mother and his father, his relations. So my sense is that his relations with his father were good, that there was a kind of reverence, deep respect, certainly, and a desire to please. But my sense, Lindsay, is that his relations with his mother were always a little bit troubled. I think that he had a desire to please and he had reverence for both. I think that there was a warmth with his father that was slightly missing with his mother. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, he spent a whole lot more time with his father. There were years where it was just really the two of them. And so that naturally is going to create a bond that is 
And the most formative years of his life, too. Yeah. And so he had a bond with his father that the other children did not. And he had a bond with his father that he did not have with his mother. I think, actually, John, while the pressure of John's name was extraordinary and and the pressure of his service was extraordinary, I don't think John put as much pressure on the children as Abigail did. I think Abigail could be... A very run a very tight ship and she put a lot of pressure on them and I think in a lot of ways John kind of left it to her to do that and so there are times that I think JQA resented her especially her meddling we're going to talk more about his relationships but her her meddling in his romantic life where I see most the the difference in the relationship is after Abigail died there's no doubt that John Quincy Adams was sad but after John died every single year on July 4th in his diary JQA made a notation about his father, about how he observed this date with real sort of bittersweet melancholy because it was the anniversary of independence, but he also had lost his father. And so I think we see in those reflections a difference in that relationship. So let's get to another one on your list, which you have sort of already noted, uh, JQ's relationship with women. So I'll start. He fell in love with a young woman named Mary Frazier. She lived nearby. She was from a good family, and he kept it secret, which was probably a mistake. When Abigail learned of this, she came down on her son like a ton of bricks, and she basically said, no, you're too young. You're not settled enough in the world. A bad early match could really derail a life. Let it go. Stop. And he did. Now, if this had happened with my mother, things would never have been the same again, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and to be fair to her, she did have practical concerns, which is that she had seen, so at the time, the Adamses were, you know, sort of what we would think of as an upper middle class family. They were not super wealthy. He had not inherited a lot of money and land. He he would inherit once his parents died, but he did not have a lot of money. And so he was going to have to take care of himself. And at the time, until you had an established career, whether that be a lawyer, which is what he was training for, or in politics or something, it, it was difficult to keep your own house. You had to have funds in order to do so. And so she was worried that he wasn't going to be able to support a wife. And she had seen a lot of other people make this mistake. And it did cause a lot of stress and pressure. And it was difficult for people who married young, which is why John and Abigail waited until John was almost 30 to get married, if I'm remembering my dates correct. So there are practical concerns there. But instead of saying, wait, she said, no. And um, as someone who hates being told what to do and resents it deeply, uh, that would not go over well for me. <laughs> I don't suppose that it would. You know, she might have said, we should talk about this. You know, we should make sure that the the finances, I want to meet the parents. We know this is, this is not something one undertakes lightly. But instead, she really just vetoed it. Then when he did marry, he wisely married In England, his parents couldn't attend. It's a fait accompli, Louisa Johnson. He marries her, brings her back to the U.S., and Abigail never really warmed to her. She was sort of glacially cordial, but she never warmed her. And this is one of the things I love most about John Adams, the father, because he realized how much Louisa was suffering under this, and he befriended her they talked about literature. They, they, they became really close. And you get a sense that he stood between her and Abigail. Yeah, what's interesting is that Abigail was quite warm and quite friendly to Louisa's family once they came over because they moved right around the same time as the wedding. They moved to the United States. And I think one of Abigail's real concerns was that Louisa was going to be un-American, that she was raised in London. Was she going to be too European in her manners? And keep in mind, Abigail had spent a lot of time in Europe and understood the difference between various cultures and was worried about that, understanding that at some point her son was going to come back and try and make a life in the United States. Would it be an impediment to his political career at a time when wives were really an essential helpmate, an essential part of the political process. So she was really nice to the family, but she wasn't necessarily as nice to Louisa. John Quincy Adams clearly let himself be a man of destiny and became a great man. But he really wanted, in many respects, to be a poet, a man of letters, as they said then. And he wrote books on belles lettres at Harvard and, he, and rhetoric and 
and so on, that he, if he hadn't been pushed in a certain direction, he might have wanted to be one of the early writers. And he did write. I think he published as many as 18 books. But that wasn't in any way the center of his life. No, and in a lot of ways it would have been hard for him to do so because that wasn't really an established career, especially in the United States, and he did have to make his own money. So I think partly it was, of course, a parental choice, but partly it was also a recognition that economy required a more established income, um, which he did. He When he came back from that first foray to Europe, which was a multi-year foray, he went to Harvard, he got his education, he went to law school, he joined the bar, he did all of the things that one was expected to do, but he never really loved it. He was a good lawyer. I think he would have been good at almost anything he set his mind to, but he never really loved it. And I think one of the reasons he was such a phenomenal diplomat was that sense of letters, that identity and that membership in sort of the international intellectual community and why he was so good at conversing with people in that space. When you think of the most intellectually prepared presidents in American history, Jefferson and John Adams, of course, and Adams maybe more than Jefferson, frankly, Theodore Roosevelt maybe more than all of them. And Roosevelt read a book a day and he was a deeply well-educated man, especially in geopolitics and naval affairs and so on which made him a great foreign policy president. But John Quincy Adams is right in that equation, one of the top five intellectuals. So his reading was of staggering dimensions. I mean, you think he's learning four, five, six languages. He's traveling. He's writing state papers. He has many duties throughout his life that that keep him at a writing desk, I suppose, three, four, five hours per day. And somehow he finds time to read not only the English classics, from Chaucer through Alexander Pope, but all the important historical and political books of the era, too. It's uh, it, it makes you a little bit depressed, doesn't it, to think of <laughs> what he could do. The thing is, is you can't compare yourself to the Adamses because you will always come up short just terribly. And they were, I mean, for better or for worse, he was keenly aware of his own flaws and regularly documented them, as did his father. It was part of their approach to life. But I think one of the funniest letters that he wrote was when he was traveling, uh, he had had intended to go from The Hague to Lisbon during his father's presidency. And instead, John sent him to, to Berlin. And he writes this letter where he expecting to go to Lisbon, he had sent crates and crates and crates and crates of books. And he had secured housing and all of this. And at the last minute, he had to change plans. So he writes this incredibly petulant letter complaining about the position being like, I am all out of books. I have run out of books to read. And you can just imagine that there's nothing more insulting to John Quincy Adams. And he has run out of books to read. And so when Theodore Roosevelt went on the River of Doubt in 1914, he took 50 books. He had what he called his pigskin library. And he had he, he got regular books and he had them rebound in pigskin so that they could survive the rigors of this journey. So they're down there. And this is, a it turns out to be an ordeal, almost a race for life for Roosevelt and his son Kermit. And about two thirds of the way through the journey, he ran out of books. And he said, now what? You know, what? <laughs> and, I mean, I, and books, Lindsay, doesn't mean like a novel by Jane Addams. It's the complete works of Milton, the complete yeah. works of Chaucer, the complete works of Shakespeare. And so, yeah. you know, think of the of this, that Theodore Roosevelt is dying of, of a variety of jungle problems, and he's reading 50 thick, complete works books and then complaining, and, and his son Kermit was fond of French literature, and so he had an anthology of French poetry, and Roosevelt read it, of course, because he could read French, and he said, I really don't like this. You know, but then he read it, because he's Roosevelt. He needed words. He, he needed, needed words to read. He, he needed words. So let me go to a, a, a more important topic from your list. He's certainly one of the top three or four secretaries of state in American history, and you could make the argument that he's the greatest secretary of state. Uh, I leave it to you to, to, to show that. He's definitely up there. I, I think he's probably top two or three, uh, certainly in terms of his experience going in, certainly in terms of what he accomplished. But I also think that his vision for foreign policy set the stage for the next centuries of American history because his, I mean, his vision, he was not the only one we, we've discussed. He's not the only one to have this vision to be sure Jefferson shared it. 
but uh, he was really kind of the one that put it into place and maneuvered it. And for all of his very interesting life experiences, I don't think that President James Monroe was going to be doing so. And it was really John Quincy Adams that made it happen. So a couple of things. One is he got us the Floridas, by which we mean the state of Florida, but also the Gulf Coast for about 150 miles in all the way to Texas. Jefferson had wanted this. In fact, that's what uh, led to the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson was angling for New Orleans and the Floridas, really control of the Gulf of Mexico and, and access to the Caribbean. Did not get it during his presidency. John Quincy Adams is the Secretary of State for James Monroe. He gets it done. That's one. He also squared off the top of America. Uh, The Louisiana Purchase had been a little uncertain about the northern boundaries. J.Q. Adams works it out with Britain, and the 49th parallel becomes the northern boundary once and for all of the United States. Those are two of his achievements as Secretary of State. And then Monroe, and Monroe, I think, is a little bit of a lightweight compared to the great ones of his time. Monroe, as president, he's says... He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> he's, I love Monroe, but he's not the sharpest <laughs> tool in the shed. But he and Adams are He has the talk. good sense to he, appoint John Quincy Adams as Secretary of State and then to listen to him. And so Adams kudos to him. Adams then promulgates what will become the Monroe Doctrine, which is not... Yes. Which was in a uh, annual message that Monroe delivered. Now, explain how, you know, this is usually Monroe, Monroe... But it's really JQ. It is. And it happens in a couple of ways. So there's tension in the southern borders and tension in Latin America over potential revolutions and independence. And Britain suggests that maybe the United States and Britain should ally together to take some action to sort of either clamp down or to guarantee independence. And... JQA says, no, 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 no. We don't want Britain anywhere near the Western Hemisphere. And so what he does is he proposes this idea in a cabinet meeting. And Monroe sends a letter to Jefferson and Madison saying, what do you think? And they write back saying, that's a great idea. So Monroe, or excuse me, so John Quincy Adams writes the language in the annual address that becomes known as the Monroe Doctrine, which says that basically hands off to the European powers for the Western Hemisphere. I'm simplifying. That's obviously not his language, but for the for the purposes of understanding the principle, that's what he says. But then, and this is the part that I think is also forgotten, he then has a very extensive correspondence and a relationship with the British minister to the United States, telling them this in nicer terms and maintaining a good relationship while also making sure that they have nothing to do with Latin America. And that piece is quite essential because that's what gets Britain to kind of accede to this idea. Not fully. I mean, they don't, you know, write a treaty themselves, but it doesn't provoke additional conflict and they don't end up intervening. And in our time, we like to talk about the special relationship between Britain and the United States, and it is a very special relationship. But we need to remember that just uh, 10 years before all of this, we'd fought the Second War of National Independence against England. They burned the Capitol. They burned the White House. They burned the tiny little congressional library. We kind of burned their Capitol, too. but We burned their Capitol? The Capitol, which was, I believe, in Toronto. Uh, we burned that first, and that's why they burned the White House, because it was in retaliation. But you know what Jefferson said after this? He said, this would justify our burning London to the ground. It's very dramatic. Yeah, I mean, he, he's such... Kind of forgot that we started it. He's such a drama queen. You know, he, he he never lifted a rifle in anger in his life. And now he's he wanted us to invade Canada both times during the revolution and in 1812. He said in 1812, if I were just a little younger, I'd be right there. Yeah, right. And then he <laughs> says we should burn... This would justify burning London to the ground. There's a vindictive crazy streak in Jefferson, and that's part of it. Well, and actually building off of this, so, you know, in the War of 1812, the War of 1812, this is another one on the list, the War of 1812 is ended by the Treaty of Ghent. And the Treaty of Ghent is really what solidifies, I think, what solidifies American independence once and for all, because I do see the War of 1812 as sort of part two. And it solidifies the United States neutrality on the world stage for almost uh, for, for another century, basically. I mean, some, we have some smaller conflicts, but we don't go over to Europe or anything like that. 
And the person that negotiated, the chief negotiator of the Treaty of Ghent was John Quincy Adams. So 10 years prior, he negotiates this treaty. Uh, 10 years later, he is then the one talking to the British and saying, hands off. But he's also saying... Let's be friends, but hands off. <laughs> we'll be... Fr- this is... You know, we should agree here. Jefferson said in the letter that he wrote to Monroe about all of this that we should have a quid pro quo. We say Europe must leave the Western Hemisphere alone, but we in turn will agree not to interfere in the affairs of the old world. Which I think that John Quincy Adams would have agreed with because both he and John Adams had a deep conviction that Europe was going to constantly be at war. That's what they had done for centuries. It was what they were going to continue to do for centuries. And often those wars had nothing to do with the United States. And the United States had no business participating in them because it had nothing to do with their interests. And so neutrality did not mean isolationism, but it meant not getting dragged into wars unnecessarily through defensive treaties that were completely foreign to American interests. And so both John Adams and John Quincy Adams, I think, would have agreed with that, that You know, right now it made no sense for them to do anything in Europe other than trade and make money. The Founding Fathers seem pretty adamant about this. George Washington in his farewell address, urging us to avoid getting drawn into the conflicts of Europe. Jefferson uh, coins the term no entangling alliances, which is often attributed to Washington. Uh, You're saying John Quincy Adams agreed, and and that's one of the bases of the Monroe Doctrine. Then comes the 20th century, Lindsay, and we get drawn in first to World War I over the deep concerns of Woodrow Wilson and the people, and then we get drawn into World War II in a more emphatic way, and suddenly people are talking about the American century. From a certain point of view, there's a, there's a kind of a sadness in that, that America was meant to be this sort of fortress of enlightenment, turning its back on the madness of the world. And yet the global situation has been such that inevitably a power as strong and an economy as mighty as America has to get drawn in. Yeah, I mean, I think there's both a, a sadness and a light to it. You know, the world is the world was always an interconnected place. It's not as though there wasn't an international community or trade or exchange of culture and ideas, but it is increasingly more connected. There's, you know, with social media and the instantaneousness of information, um, as well as the ability of weapons to cross oceans and and continents in really the what feels like the blink of an eye. It's impossible to ignore these things, but that also, I think, presents some really wonderful opportunities. It's just, we're not always great at determining what is really in American interests and what is not. We sometimes get that wrong. We need to take a break. We're talking with Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky. 10 Things About John Quincy Adams. Fascinating conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Listening to America. And I want to say something about this just for a moment, Lindsay. You know, people, some people are concerned about, well, what happens to the Jefferson Hour now that it's Listening to America? And I keep reassuring people, nothing much changes. You're going to be a very constant guest. We're talking about the early national period, Jefferson, John Adams, Abigail Adams, John Quincy Adams, James Monroe. We're not going to deviate very much from our purpose. And, and I so appreciate you because you know, we're both champing at the bit to talk about things outside of the early national period, and we will and have. This is really the foundation of America. And as we approach the 250th birthday of the country, July 4th, 2026, July 4th, huh, who made that? Uh, well, I won't say who made that happen on July 4th, 17th. <laughs> but anyway, as we approach that date, not July 2nd, not Bunker Hill, not not 1783, but Jefferson's big day, I think it's important for us to be talking about the original intent of the American Republic, that, it's, that period of intense idealism coupled with a pragmatic approach to life that made this a really, really remarkable republic. And so I just want to assure people that, that nothing much will change except the name of this program. So let me go to... Well, if I may, I think that this this episode is a really great example of that because 
most of John Quincy Adams' life is squarely in this period, and yet it goes beyond. And if we didn't talk about the part that's going beyond, it would be a very incomplete and I think unsatisfying episode. But some of the most, I think, impactful and long-lasting things that he did came a little bit later and spoke to what's going to come next. So it's really not a matter of saying, like, we're going to abandon this. It's just, let's keep talking about it and keep seeing where the story goes. And we'll and we'll stretch the timeline some and widen the aperture of the lens. So let's move quickly here through his presidency. So he becomes president in 1824, serves just one term, is overwhelmed in 1828 by Andrew Jackson and the, the spirit of Western populism. As quickly as you can characterize the presidency of John Quincy Adams. The presidency was a real disappointment. Uh, he had the unfortunate luck to be coming at a point when politics was shifting dramatically. It was the collapse of what we call the era of good feelings, which was essentially one party rule under the original Democratic Party, the rise of Andrew Jackson, as you said, the rise of Western populism. He didn't really have a party base because of these shifting forces. He wasn't very good at coalition building anyway. He was too smart to get along with most people. He didn't really like them. It was very frustrating. Um, and so it was, it was a grave disappointment. Uh, three things worth mentioning. As I said, foreign policy was always his strength. He left the United States in a better place diplomatically and, and on a stronger footing with foreign policy than he came in, as did John Adams, I should say. Second, he wrote a remarkably forward-thinking infrastructure plan and proposed it to Congress. It went nowhere, but as we think about what came next, I think this idea inspired a lot of the infrastructure that we saw afterwards. And he wrote Weights and Measures that was scientifically far ahead of his time. And I think one of the greatest governing documents in sort of a very weird way, one of the greatest and most brilliant governing documents, not particularly riveting reading, but also chalk that up to his extraordinariness as Secretary of State uh, instead of his presidency. So why wouldn't the Congress of the United States go along with a very sensible infrastructure program? Uh, three reasons. One, he proposed it, and there were sections of Congress that were supporters of Andrew Jackson that were determined to make his presidency a failure, regardless of what he had proposed. So there were the there was the partisan split, which we often talk about today. It existed back then. They wanted him to fail. Two, there were a lot of people who felt that the federal government had no business investing in anything national because the federal government was supposed to be small, powers were supposed to be reserved to the states. Anything that gave the federal government too much power could be used in other ways. And at this point, people are starting to think about, well, if the federal government can create canals, can they limit slavery? And so there starts to be a concern about how the federal government and how federal power is being used. And the third reason is that the different regions of the country had different infrastructure needs and different infrastructure demands. So whereas one part of the country really wanted canals, others maybe wanted roads, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it was very hard to get agreement on where the funds should go and what they should be used for. So when we say infrastructure, they said internal improvements. And Washington had been interested in a canal on the Potomac, as had Jefferson. But Jefferson was one of those states' rights guys who didn't want to read the Constitution in a big way, and he opposed Monroe's flirting around with the idea of internal improvements. John Quincy Adams doesn't get away with it. And here, you know, here's what really bothers me. So much of American history has been bedeviled by race and slavery. So you mentioned it, that one main reason why states would not, especially southern states, would not get on board with an infrastructure bill is because they said, if you have the power to do that, the federal government might have the power to, and then you fill in the blank, to end slavery, to damage slavery, to you know, put slavery on the road to extinction, to et cetera. And John C. Calhoun said as much. He said, if they can do this, then they can do that. And if you think about the number of times in American history that the protection of slavery and afterwards the protection of apartheid and Jim Crow has gotten in the way of forward progress as a nation, it's astounding. And so these people that say, oh, we don't want to hear about critical race theory or the 1619 Project, or that's wrong. We have to acknowledge that the South has had a stranglehold on this country from the beginning at the Constitution, in the early national period, in the run-up to the war, through the war, and then tragically in the aftermath. 
of the Civil War. As a historian, you know, our, our purpose is to clarify, not to judge, but it's hard not to feel depressed by the way in which race has been a kind of straitjacket for America. At all of these moments, race and slavery served as impediments or got in the way or were deployed for a particular reason. And also, the Civil War was fought over this. And also, there were these positive developments. It's it's not a matter of denying that progress has been made. It's a, it's a matter of understanding fully how the story developed and unfolded. And if we were to try and tell the story and omit that part, it wouldn't make any sense. Because... Otherwise, it would appear as though these congressmen were being ridiculous or were not acting rationally, but they had their own set of concerns. And under those set of concerns, which included slavery, they were acting rationally to pursue their goals. So it's really not a matter of trying to say that, you know, this one thing is to blame for everything, but rather let's make sure we talk about all the factors that were in play. Every factor has to be on the table and you can't understand it without this factor being at the center. It's not the only factor, but it's right at the center And if you think about what's happening in the extreme end of the conservative right now, you almost have to say that they're wanting to try to undo the civil rights movement as much as is possible. Fortunately, not much is possible, but that's a, that's a continuum in American history. So, Lindsay, that takes us to my two favorite moments in the life of John Quincy Adams. Number one, the gag rule. So people were beginning to petition the Congress of the United States. And do something about slavery. The southern states managed to enforce a gag rule in which the the Senate and the House could not accept petitions, that they would be immediately laid on the table and then forgotten. And John Quincy Adams decided that, A, that's terrible democratic theory, and B, it's just plain wrong. We're going to have to, you know, this is this is our only way through this. So, so tell us about his heroic role in ending the gag rule. So he protested against it vigorously and uh, refused to accept this this situation and he used a series of parliamentary maneuvers because, again, going back to his reading, John Quincy Adams read everything, including parliamentary rules of procedure and the rules of the Senate and the rules of the House and understood exactly how all these things worked better than most people did. Uh, there was a great, actually, um, miniseries podcast by Bob Crawford called Founding Son, in particular about this era of John Quincy Adams' life that came out uh, a couple months ago and looks into this process. And what he basically, he used a series of votes and measures over a period of time to defeat this process. And he was able to do so, one, because he had this incredible attention to detail, but two, because of who he was. So many other Northerners who objected to a gag rule or who criticized slavery were either attacked or threatened or beaten with canes or, you know, any number of other forms of violence by Southern representatives because that was how they were defending their quote unquote honor. But it was John Quincy Adams. He was a former president. It was son of a president. It was this incredible statesman. They couldn't challenge him to a duel. They couldn't even beat him with a cane. They couldn't even really physically threaten him. So he used his incredible prestige of who he was to attack this rule. So Lindsay, just to catch everybody up, he loses the presidency to, um, Andrew Jackson in 1828, you would have thought that'd be the end of it. He'd go home to Braintree, lick his wounds, write a memoir, and do the things that former presidents do. But no, he's promoted for the House of Representatives. Uh, he's elected in 1830, takes his seat in 1831, and spends the rest of his life in the House of Representatives and dies in the Capitol, has a stroke at the Capitol and dies thereafter in 1848. It takes a certain kind of person to do that, and he convinced himself, and I think accurately, that it it was not a, a, a diminution. It was a sign of what a republic is, that, that you're not too good to be a, a member of the House of Representatives, even if you have been the president of this country. I admire this. You know, it, It's not that he was just looking like an ambitious man for more roles. I think he felt there's work to be done, and there's a way that I can do it and maybe more effectively than I was able to do it as the president. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it, it was a real commitment to the idea that once you are no longer president, you are a citizen. You are not anyone particularly special. But it was also a recognition that his position was unique and 
could be used for good and could be used for good in a way that, as I said, few other people could deploy. And the people, his supporters that urged him to do this also recognized it and they wanted him to go and fight for this particular cause. I should say much to his wife's consternation. She didn't really want him to do this for the rest of his life. Uh, but he he felt called to it and he was good at it. And, um, you know, if, you, if anyone has the opportunity to, to, to tour the Capitol, you can see where his desk was and then and if Congress is out of session and you can get sort of access to the special rooms, what is now the women's um, house lounge was at the time the Speaker of the House's office. And the couch that he died on is still in that room. Now, well, that's very, very moving. So just uh, again, to reiterate, the South had prevented petitions from being taken seriously in the Congress of the United States. John Quincy Adams was, of course, a principled antagonist to slavery, but he didn't grandstand and give speeches against slavery and 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 make a nuisance of himself in doing this he very thoughtfully fought on this one front about democratic process and was able finally to overcome the opposition and allow petitions to be considered by the Congress of the United States. And the South didn't want this done because it, they realized that their power was waning and that the North was an industri- becoming an industrial powerhouse. It, certainly its economy was stronger. They knew the time wasn't on their side, and so they had to do everything in their power to forestall what they all assumed was probably an inevitable future. And as you said, other people who spoke out about slavery were beaten up, called out for duels, um, beaten nearly to death on the floor of the Congress of the United States. He was sort of impregnable to this because he was A, an Adams, B, the former president, and everyone got it that, that he was one of the most formidable political beings in the United States. So we have to give him extraordinary credit for that achievement. It didn't change much. You know, the Civil War was by now probably inevitable. But nevertheless, to think that after all the disappointments of his life, he made that his quest and succeeded in it gives me the deepest respect for him. Yeah, amazing. So then let's go to the Amistad. Explain that. What happened? The Amistad was a ship. It was a Spanish-controlled ship, and it was picking up enslaved individuals. It was buying them and taking them to from Africa and was taking them to Cuba because there was a law on the books in the United States that slaves could not be purchased or imported from Africa. So the ships would go to Cuba, would basically take these people there, sort of run them through the system and then take them to the United States where they were sold for a higher profit. And in theory, then they were not breaking the law by the direct spirit of it. In 188, under a compromised provision of the Constitution, it was now legally possible to outlaw the slave trade. Jefferson proposed to Congress that they do so. They did. But slave plantation owners and slave traders found ways around this piece of legislation and continued to bring enslaved people into the country through third-party means. Yes. So partway through this voyage, there was an uprising on the ship. The enslaved captives overthrew the Spanish crew, and then were sort of the ship was captured or or seized control of off of American waters. And so the question became: Were these individuals Spanish, truly Spanish property, because they had been in Cuba and therefore would have to be returned to Cuba and returned to slavery, or had the Spanish ship broken the law and therefore they should be returned to Africa? So it was a it was a complex court case because of course anyone who was hearing the case couldn't necessarily deny the humanity of the situation, but laws are often designed to take emotion out of it. And so it was a question of how was this case going to be decided? They they weren't supposed to come to the US. The ship was commandeered. It winds up sort of getting blown over to the American coast. And so now we have a problem because it's it's landed on American soil and we have to decide whether we return it to the ship owners, whether we punish the mutineers, what should we do here? So how does this play out? So the original court that heard the case ruled in favor of the enslaved Africans, ruled that they had any right to restore their freedom because it had come from Africa and therefore they should be returned to Africa. And President Martin Van Buren, 
who was a northerner but had a lot of southern sympathies and was trying to hold together a coalition that included a lot of southerners ordered the case be appealed to the supreme court and at this point john quincy adams who is in the house of representatives agrees to argue the case on behalf of the amistad in front of the supreme court they sought him out in particular because they needed a lawyer of gravitas they needed someone who could speak before the Supreme Court and garner respect, especially because this is the same Supreme Court that had been quite friendly to slavery. This is the same Supreme Court that was really dominated by Southerners and um, was going to go on to decide the, the Dred Scott decision, which was one of the worst slavery decisions. So they needed someone who could bring heft to this decision. John Quincy Adams agrees to argue the case. He does so in such a persuasive and perf- and compelling way that he convinces Supreme Court justices who are pro-slavery to decide on behalf of the Africans who decide- who then, once they won this case, elected to be returned to Africa. And it is a remarkable achievement. It is a remarkable success. And I think it was a, a big turning point for him as well in his evolution of abolitionist thought because he was meeting with these men who were so dignified and so well-spoken under the most cruel and terrible circumstances. It's such a remarkable moment. You just, you hope that that decision is going to take root in America and, and lead to something good. It doesn't. It's kind of a one-off in the middle of the of the buildup to the war. But still, John Quincy Adams, you know, making this argument, there's nothing of the orator in him. This is going to be like so solid an argument that it's going to be impossible not to agree. Although apparently he really did, while he was not necessarily naturally in order on that particular day, he knocked it out of the park. <laughs> and what I think is extra interesting about this moment is his son, Charles Francis Adams, really didn't want him to take the case because he was building up his own business and he had a lot of family ties. He, he ended up marrying a very wealthy heiress and his his in-laws were, were Southern. And so he asked his dad not to take the case and John Quincy Adams did anyway. Amazing story. Lindsay, thank you so much. This was really a great episode of Listening to America. I so appreciate your scholarship and your insights. Let's meet again soon for another edition of Listening to America. Thanks, everyone.